Good evening. My name is Stacy Gallen, and I am the founding director of the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust. Along with the International March of the Living, the Miller Center for Community Protection and Resilience, Teva Pharmaceuticals, and in cooperation with the USC Shoah Foundation, we are proud to bring you tonight's program, The Choice is Ours. The field of medicine carries a great deal of power and privilege, and along with that comes certain choices. Historically, the medical profession was founded on the Hippocratic tenet of first doing no harm, and the essential importance of the relationship between the physician and the patient. However, throughout history, we have seen examples of the abuse of the power and privilege of medicine, perhaps none so egregious as what took place during the Holocaust when healers became killers. What led to this choice? And what about those who chose a different path? Those who remain dedicated to healing and saving lives, even while risking their own in ghettos and concentration camps. What can we learn from these stories, from these choices about the ethics of a profession and how morals can guide us through the darkest times? The lessons of the Holocaust, how the power and privilege of medicine can be abused in times of crisis, have informed the way in which we deal with our current situation as we struggle to meet the unprecedented challenges caused by COVID-19. Tonight, we will hear about the choices made by those in the healthcare profession and the implications of these choices for us all. In contrast to Nazi ideology, which victimized the most vulnerable in society and the Nazi doctors who performed the most horrific experiments on their helpless prisoners, many medical staff under Nazi occupation, Jewish and non-Jewish alike, courageously refused to yield. We are pleased to debut this short film, The Choice is Ours. During the Holocaust, doctors and other medical professionals faced difficult moral and ethical decisions unlike any other time in history. What lessons can we, as a society, learn from those doctors and nurses as we struggle to endure our current global pandemic about medical ethics and our human nature as a whole. Viktor Frankl was an Auschwitz survivor, psychiatrist, and best-selling author who impacted millions of people's lives with his message that our very existence needs to have meaning. Without it, it can lead to suffering and a lack of will to live on. Frankel attributes surviving the Holocaust to the love and concern he felt for his wife. In his seminal book, Man's Search for Meaning, he describes how he and his fellow prisoners were able to endure the Nazis' daily beatings and brutal marches by focusing on what was most meaningful to them, their love for their wives. From this experience, Frankel learned what would be the main theme of his book. Suffering ceases to be suffering the moment it finds meaning. We are living in a society to satisfy and gratify each and every human need, except for one need, the most basic and fundamental need operant in man, the need for meaning. During the current lockdown, surveys reveal that approximately 40% of North Americans are grappling with at least one mental health or drug-related problem. Young adults have been hit harder. A recent survey by the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention revealed that one in four young adults had thought about taking their own lives in the first year of the pandemic. I was taught that if you see a person drowning, you must jump into the water to save them whether you can swim or not. Irena Sendler chose not to be a bystander during the Holocaust. The Polish nursing student risked her life to help save thousands of Jews. In 1940, Sendler, a Polish Catholic, was outraged at the racist injustices of the Nazis, who forced the Jews of Warsaw, approximately 30% of the city's entire population, into a small walled-off area of the city the now infamous Warsaw Ghetto. Who 
to nie będzie miał pojęcia o wiecie i ciepło nie do powców lepia. Ulice z trupami dzieci. Zebrałam pięć osób i powiedziałam, słuchajcie, musimy wydać wojny Hitlerowi. Sendler's active protests led her to be suspended from nursing school, but that didn't stop her. She found a job working in the ghetto. Unbeknownst to the Nazis, each day she would smuggle out Jewish babies and children in her cart and place them in homes with Poles who, like her, were compelled to help Jews despite the risk of certain death if they were caught. The Nazis eventually discovered what Sendler was doing. They arrested her and tortured her to reveal the names of her collaborators, but she did not break. The nursing student managed to escape and survive the remainder of the war in hiding. It is estimated Irena Sandler and her fellow Poles saved 2,500 Jewish children from the Warsaw Ghetto. She lived until she was 98 and is considered a hero in Poland. Her courageous acts led her to be recognized as one of the righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem. Heroes do extraordinary things. What I did was not an extraordinary thing. It was normal. While the challenges of the current pandemic are vastly different from those faced by medical professionals during the Holocaust, today's frontline workers also show enormous courage and bravery, risking their lives and often confronting difficult moral and ethical decisions. While imprisoned in Auschwitz, Dr. Gisela Pearl, a Jewish gynecologist from Hungary, was forced to work for the infamous Dr. Mengele, the angel of death. Upon her arrival to the camp, he instructed Dr. Pearl to send any pregnant prisoners to him. She soon discovered Mengele was using them as human guinea pigs for his ghastly medical experiments. And when he was done with them, they were sent to their death in the gas chambers. Dr. Pearl understood that if she saved both mother and child, they would certainly be murdered. She made a difficult decision. She would save the mothers. I decided that never again would there be a pregnant woman in Auschwitz. From that moment on, when any pregnant woman arrived in Auschwitz, Pearl would convince them to allow her to perform an abortion. In filthy conditions, with no access to medical instruments, she would secretly perform the procedures in the barracks. And more shocking, if the mothers were too far along for an abortion, Pearl would instead deliver the newborn and have to euthanize the child after the birth. Dr. Gisela Pearl saved hundreds of Jewish women from certain death in Auschwitz. After the war, Pearl began helping pregnant women give birth again. Jizzy Doctor, as women survivors would call her, went on to safely deliver thousands of children during her long medical career. Pearl, Sendler, and Frankel all illustrate the important leadership role medical professionals play in the moral, ethical, and emotional health of our society. The lessons they leave us with are profound. To find meaning amidst catastrophe. To follow the righteous path over our own self-interests, to choose hope over hopelessness. The choice is ours. The more one forgets himself by giving himself to a cause to serve or another person to love, the more human he is. Viktor Frankl. I would now like to introduce cantor Aviva Reisky and guitarist Tom Bellman. They will now perform Misha Berach, a Song of Healing by Debbie Friedman. Our lives a blessing and let us sing. 
For the past seven years, Dr. Susan Miller has been studying medical research misconduct in the Holocaust because she believes it raises important questions about self-reflection and how she might have behaved if she were a doctor in Germany at that time. Doing so, she says, helps her teach residents to look at medicine from more than one perspective. During COVID-19, Dr. Miller helped oversee decisions about which medicines and modalities to try on patients at her hospital to ensure that the lessons of history were being applied to current research ethics. The first ethical precept that needs to be considered is to do no harm. The ethical term for that is beneficence, but the concept is how do you prevent harm? And part of the way that this was addressed was looking at the scientific design which vaccines were chosen, how were they monitoring the administration of the vaccines, did the statisticians play a role in determining whether or not the study would have early termination points if this was based on side effect processes, did the study design include a mechanism for early stoppage of the study, this is known as early termination, or if there was safety signaling, if someone had an adverse event such as an unexpected side effect or toxicity, did the protocol have a suspension of enrollment? Another concept has to do with the concept of justice. How were people enrolled onto the study? Which candidate populations were chosen for the study population? Was there a respect for autonomy? What were the consent processes that were included? How did they determine whether someone really understood what the research entailed? Did they have a mechanism if the vaccine was determined to be safe and effective, if individuals received a placebo, were they then allowed to have open access labeling to the active vaccine? Um, another question that is still considered controversial was whether or not you intentionally exposed vaccine recipients to COVID infection as a mechanism to test whether or not the vaccine was effective or not. One of the first things about the vaccine, the vaccine was intended to help the individual in a society. Okay, it was not just meant for a generalized or a subspecialty group, it was meant for all individuals in a society. And it was meant to um, be distributed and available so that the individuals who participated in the study, it was not transactional, it was not based on um, them having to sacrifice their life in order for the society to have a benefit. Another thing that was essential was the consent process, and this consent process included not only for the individuals that were participating in the vaccine, but for the individuals that were receiving the vaccine. And the other thing that was very important is as we learned more information, as we had more scientific knowledge, we were able to shift what um, 
our actions were going to be so that vaccines that were found to not be effective, that the sponsors of those vaccines stopped the research for that, that they had early termination for that instead of getting to the final destination of number of enrolled subjects. Okay, so what happened is that the society itself, and this included government, um, regulatory institutions and state governments made the decisions up front how they were going to begin the initial allocation of the vaccine. So these, because there was a shortage of vaccine, we didn't have enough to on day one immunize everyone in the U.S. And so that they had these multidisciplinary groups determine who was first in line for the vaccine, who needed the vaccine first based on medical criteria or clinical risk criteria. And then they had a monitoring process for this. So the beneficence that we talked about, the justice um, arguments that we talked about, the informed consent processes were all maintained throughout the clinical application of this vaccine. During my residency training, I learned that there is an urgent need for free medical care for survivors. So I started doing house calls, especially to those who are homebound or incapable of traveling to clinics. As the first lockdown in Israel began, I became overloaded with far too many requests for me to handle just by myself. Magda Greif, an Israeli physician and Holocaust survivor, was found dead in her home, apparently two weeks after she had passed away on Passover Eve. This tragic event shocked me and was the major driving force for me to start thinking bigger and to take action. The response was incredible and overwhelming. I think that my call to action resonated with so many doctors. Within just a few days, hundreds of physicians from all specialties of medicine signed up to volunteer. During these difficult times of social distancing and isolation, simple procedures can yield a huge impact on the survivor's life. I'll give you an example. An ENT physician made a house call to clean out the auditory canals of a survivor. Now, before her visit, her deteriorating hearing made it almost impossible for her to communicate with her friends and family. After this very basic procedure, she became able to reach out to relatives, listen to the radio, and in effect, reconnect with the outside world. As a doctor, I feel an obligation to care and protect every last living survivor before it is too late. Being able to do so is deeply meaningful to many, and in turn, I can even say, transforms us as doctors. What happens when we choose to place differing values on life based on perceived worth to society rather than respecting the inherent humanity of all individuals? Dr. Michael Robertson's work focuses on the Nazi persecution of the disabled and its relevance for current issues in practice and policy. Many have looked at the Nazi period and what steps enabled the crimes perpetrated uh, under the Nazi government by the medical and nursing professions 
And consistently, the observation has been that the first step was permitting a relative valuation of life. That is to say that some lives were of lesser value and lesser worthy of consideration than others. Indeed, the early writings in eugenics uh, used the term life unworthy of life. When we consider uh, this as the first step in uh, mass killing of the sick and disabled or genocide uh, of the Jewish civilization of Europe and other victim groups, we have to continue to question whether our public policy and our cultural norms uh, assume that there is a relative valuation of life. During the COVID pandemic, um, the most vulnerable groups uh, to the disease have been uh, the elderly and those living with chronic diseases, um, people with severe and uh, moderately severe disabilities and certain uh, uh, ethnicities. Now, public policy decisions haven't necessarily sought to directly target these groups. However, when we consider uh, the uh, death toll and the morbidity associated with COVID-19, it has disproportionately affected groups um, who historically have been judged as being uh, having lives of, of lesser worth. And again, this is not saying that public policy decisions are just what the Nazis did, but rather require us to question whether or not our public policy and our social institutions operate on the assumption that some lives are of lesser value or less worth than others. My name is Jordana Sachs and I am a family physician in Toronto. We are going to be giving you the AstraZeneca vaccine today. Giving vaccines and helping to end this pandemic is the best thing that I've done as a physician. We are literally saving lives. The pandemic has been difficult for everybody. Anxiety and depression is on the rise, is disproportionately impacted certain communities, lower socioeconomic communities, racialized communities, the elderly. Such a beautiful day, right, Bobby? Right. The sunshine feels so nice. Yeah. You can't be a granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor and not have it impact you. She never spoke about the Holocaust growing up. My grandmother was born in Czepic, Poland. She was the eldest of three kids. Her father was a shoemaker. Her mother ran a little grocery stand. So they led sort of a simple, modest life. And then the war hit. And my bubby went into a forced labor camp just a few days before she turned 20. She told us that, you know, they would get one cup of coffee in the day, they would get one ladle of soup and one piece of bread, and that was their nourishment for the entire day. She was liberated by the Russians on May 8th, 1945. Now she has 14 great-grandchildren. Based on what I've learned from the Holocaust, I hope that I'm more empathetic um, and that I treat everyone equally and equitably. So when the York Region Public Health Unit put a call out for physicians to come help vaccinate in retirement homes and long-term care homes, I quickly jumped at that chance. At the time, I didn't know that my grandmother's retirement home was on the list of scheduled sites. But it was just a little bit of luck, I think maybe a little bit of fate, that I got scheduled the day her retirement home was receiving the Pfizer vaccine. She does have cognitive impairment, so I was concerned she wouldn't recognize who I was. My sister gave me the idea to print a photo of my bubby and myself and bring it to the retirement home. And I pulled the photo out as soon as I saw her and I was, you know, bubby, it's Jordana. And um, she was like, Jordana? And immediately, you know, my eyes welled up. 
I gave her the shot and the significance was not lost on me. I was overcome with emotion. I knew that my bubby gave my dad life, my dad gave me life, and now I had just done something in return that could potentially save her life. I think COVID has taught us all many things. The past year has really been a time of increased self-awareness, reflection, the value of family, the value of being kind. All of these things we've learned from the Holocaust and from the strength of the survivors. Aviva Reisky and Tom Bellman will now perform the musical piece, Heal Us Now, which is based on verses in the Book of Psalms, as well as the Book of Numbers, where Moses pleaded with God to heal his ailing sister, Miriam. The English words and melody were written by cantor Leon Scher. On behalf of the International March of the Living, the Maimonides Institute for Medicine, Ethics, and the Holocaust, the Miller Center for Community Protection and Resilience, Teva Pharmaceuticals, and the USC Shoah Foundation, we want to thank all of our presenters for graciously sharing their time, talent, and stories with us. To those of you watching this program and our recent presentation of Medicine and Morality, Lessons from the Holocaust and COVID-19, we are grateful for your support and look forward to sharing additional educational programs with you.